Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Yes, welcome back to Narrow Squeak. We are your hosts. I'm Crystal. I am Sheena. And we are here to talk about some creepy weird shit. <laughs> <laughs> that we are. Our last episode, which went out today, was on exonerations. So, actually, one thing I did want to say is thanks to Crystal. Maybe some of you already know this, but we are... We are on Spotify now, and apparently we're on YouTube, so I kind of feel like we're the shit. <laughs> I, I feel like we're, you know, we're making it big. <laughs> yeah, so that's kind of exciting. Last time I had mentioned that The Ripper is coming out on Netflix, so that is uh, that is out now. So I should maybe mention, I think a lot of people may have thought when I said that, that it would cover Jack the Ripper, but in fact, it was actually covering British serial killer um, Peter Sutcliffe, who was known as the infamous Yorkshire Ripper, pretty much a monster like most other serial killers. So it kind of profiles that and uh, shows that there's actually some of the children of the victims involved in this. They were around five or six, sort of when this was happening, and he tended to sort of pick his victims from the red light district so it does touch on that but uh, in he was found guilty of murdering 13 women and attempting several others so if if you thought it was Jack the Ripper and that wasn't really your jam it's not so uh, you might find this interesting I unfortunately I think I've only made it to episode two I'm not really sure if it's the holidays or what else is kind of going on super distracted in other parts of life but uh, it is so far definitely worth the watch and by some people might have thought she means me well (laughs) yeah so Crystal and I were texting and I was like yeah the Ripper and she's like well Jack the Ripper really isn't my thing and I was like that's cool but it isn't Jack the Ripper so (laughs) it's Peter (laughs) Sutcliffe because of that maybe I thought there might have been some confusion on other people's ends so anyways that's sort of my update and uh, hopefully if you haven't watched it uh, you will give it a shot and uh, maybe by then I will have actually hunkered down and finished the series (laughs) That sounds good. You'll have to let me know how it is because I still can't get into it yet. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) I will definitely do that. (laughs) I've been watching all the other things, but uh, none of that. So, (laughs) (laughs) yeah, so what we decided, if you listened to the last episode, we were going to split this up into a two-part thing so that we can put episodes out weekly. So one week you'll get me, the next week you'll get Sheena or vice versa, Uh, but we'll both still be covering the same topic. And at the end of last week's episode, if you listened in, we start, we decided that we were going to cover survival stories. And did you have a hard time picking this week? I actually didn't uh, because fortunately I had watched, somehow it popped up and I watched this documentary that was on Prime. And so I'd watched that a couple of weeks ago and then this came up and I was like, holy crap, I have my survival story. So yeah, it wasn't hard for me, but I'm guessing it may have been for you. <laughs> so, originally, no. Originally, <laughs> I knew, I narrowed in, I knew exactly what story I wanted to talk about because it was crazy, and it involved a samurai sword, and... Oh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> yes. Uh, so it was going to be this great story to tell, but do you think I could find anywhere where I watched that? <laughs> of course not. <laughs> and then when I started Googleizing, Googleizing, <laughs> <Googleizing. laughs> when I started Googling, woman attacked, samurai sword, survival, a lot of other things came up. <laughs> I was like, how many times has that happened? <laughs> well, More than we'd like to think, or? <laughs> There's at least three other stories, one of which was actually a woman that attacked a man with the samurai sword, and that one comes up a lot. Okay. Um, (laughs) So at some other point, I will go back and read that story, but instead, I ended up landing on something that I had actually watched as a movie, and the people that made the movie tried to say it wasn't based on this, but it's too similar. They're like, there's no way it's not based on it, but I think they were just worried about plagiarizing and stuff, right? 
So I found this story and I really like it. And it ended up, I got really deep into it. And now four pages later, I'm going to tell it to you. <laughs> I'm excited because if you really like it, I'm sure that I will too. <laughs> and I won't be surprised if you know of this story. Okay. So it's really good. All right. So I'm just going to jump right in. Yay. Yes. So on November 10th, 1986, a young woman was brought into the Perth police station claiming she had been held captive and raped, but was able to escape. The first officer she encountered didn't really believe her, so they passed her off to the newest member of their force, Constable Laura Hancock. Laura was only 22 years old, and this was her very first statement she had ever taken. Luckily, listening to the story that the woman was telling, Laura was persistent with her supervisors about her belief in the woman's story and she kept pushing and pushing they kept sending her back in and finally she convinced them to actually look into it so this is what the girl said happened uh kate moyer was 17 years old and she had gone out with friends for the evening they had been drinking and she was on her way home she was hitchhiking when she was picked up by david and Catherine burney story <laughs> i knew you would <laughs> <laughs> continue on though because i'll never get sick of hearing it <laughs> okay so she was picked up by the couple once in the car they held her at knife point and took her to their home on morehouse street on morehouse street she asked what they planned to do with her and they told her that if she was good they'd only rape her they made her dance for them and she was forced to sleep between them while handcuffed to david at one point, they had her call her mother and tell her she was staying at a friend's house because she had drank too much. Uh, she said that this was done while David was holding a knife to her throat. Her hope was that her mother would he hear something in her voice and would know that something wasn't right and would call and check up on her because she never really drank to the point that she was too inebriated to get herself home. She hoped that her mom would look into it, but I don't think she did. There, there's no, There's nothing saying that her mom was looking for her. While there, Kate made a point of watching and memorizing everything she could, including the music that they played, the movies that they watched. She even went as far as to make little notes and hide them where she was changed, so there was evidence of her being there. The next morning, David got up and went to work as normal, and Catherine, who was dealing drugs out of the house, went to answer the door and forgot to actually chain Kate back up. Uh, so Kate took the opportunity to break a lock on one of the closed windows that, in the room that she was in and climbed out. In the process, she fell and hit her head on the concrete outside the window. <laughs> she went down the street and started knocking on neighbors' doors asking for help, but no one answered. Now, <laughs> honestly, personally, if I see a woman who probably looks pretty crazed in just her, she said she was in just leggings, a tank top, and her underwear, and barefoot, I don't know if I would answer the door to that. I'm that person that would. <laughs> Surprise, I haven't been kidnapped. Me too, a little bit. <laughs> so I wouldn't answer the door, but I sure as hell would call the cops. <laughs> yeah, crazy. well, at least that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I made a note. I made a note here, said, actually, let's be real. That's me on a good day. <laughs> <laughs> See? <laughs> Maybe I wouldn't answer the door. <laughs> At one point, she had actually jumped a fence and was attacked by the homeowner's dog. And then she ended up making her way to a shopping complex and went into the, into the vacuum cleaner store. Uh, the owner or worker, whoever she ran into there, ended up calling the police. And that's when she was taken to the station. Now we're back to Constable Hancock listening to the story. And Kate was giving too many details. There, She knew their address. She knew their phone number. She also had looked on a pill bottle and knew david's full name they had given her aliases so she knew what their real names were she had just been really observant of everything she even went as far as to tell them they had watched rocky all night long and when the police went into the house it was still in the vcr so she also drew like something on a piece of paper and hid it uh, so there was proof that she had been there and that was found as well when the police went in to search the house. So at this time, David and Catherine Burney were arrested and interrogated separately. Catherine claimed she had never met Kate, while David said he they had had sex, but it was consensual, of course. Eventually, the detective got David to confess, but when he did, they got more than what they bargained for, because what they found out at this time was that David was actually, David and Catherine were actually serial killers. So 
not only did he admit that he had raped and kidnapped Kate, he also outlined four other murders they had committed over the previous month. They hadn't even found the bodies yet, so they didn't know that these cases were connected, let alone that they had anything more than missing women. What we now know is that Kate Moyer had survived the worst serial murderer duo in Australia. So if you look up on Wikipedia, Australia serial killers, Catherine and David's names are the first two on the list. Of course they are. <laughs> uh -huh. So now let's learn a little bit about who abducted her. So David Burney is the oldest of five children from a very dysfunctional family. There was rumors of incest and molestation within the family. And when David's par parents went to get married, the priest actually didn't even want to perform the ceremony because he said he couldn't see anything good coming from their union. Oh, oh wow. Yeah. Uh, they did end up getting married, though. And I, I can't find whether it was actually that priest that did it or if they had to go somewhere else because I did look for that. <laughs> um, <laughs> During their marriage, David's mother was known to have affairs and even had sex with taffy, dri ta taffy drivers, even had sex with taxi drivers in lieu of paying the fare. And some of the comments from people who knew the family said that David had actually watched and witnessed this. Yeah, uh, that'll fuck you up. Yeah, just a little. David's friends from school said the home was always dirty and the family never had real meals together. Like the parents never actually made dinner and sat down and, eat and ate. So then Catherine, wa who was two years old when her mother died giving birth to her brother. The baby died two days later, leaving Catherine with just her father. Her father then ended up sending her to live with her mother's parents and left her there until she was 10. When she turned 10, he came back and fought for custody of her again and won. Uh, so he was given sole custody of her at that time. Then at, at about 12 years old is when she met David, who by this time was 15. David and his family had moved to Perth, and that's when they met. Um, right away, there was interest from both parties, but they didn't actually start dating until she was 14. Multiple times throughout their relationship, Catherine's dad begged her to leave David, which only made her want to stay with him more because she's a teenager. And that's how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> During their relationship, um, part of the reason that her dad wanted them to split up was because she was started having issues with the local police. And she was in and out of jail. So when David was 15, he left school to be an apprentice jockey. Co-workers remember him being cruel to the horses. And he would expose himself and walk around naked in the stables. And that was just a Monday for them working with him. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's one hell of a Monday. <laughs> I thought my Mondays were bad, but that takes the cake. <laughs> um, Sorry. Oh, that's <laughs> uh, oh, he broke into the room of the woman he was boarding with and tried to rape her he was in and out of prison with misdemeanor offenses and became a pornography addict at about this time so while he's the jockey in, in and out of jail she's getting herself into trouble so they decide to, to go their separate ways David and Catherine both separately go off and get married. David has a daughter with his wife, and then they separate. Catherine, however, has seven children with her husband. To everyone else, she seems very happy with her first husband. When she goes, I think they said when she went into the hospital, though, to have her tubes tied, when her husband showed up to see her, David was by her bedside. And then in 1985, Catherine officially left her husband uh, seemingly out of the blue to go back to David. In 1986, David is working at a wrecking yard and Catherine is selling drugs from their home. Behind closed doors, they were progressing sexually towards the crimes they would end up committing. But on the exterior, they just looked like any other couple in the neighborhood. They never officially actually got married, but Catherine changed her name to Bernie to kind of be closer to him connected uh, to him by changing her name. They are progressing with their fantasies and at one point David's brother is living with them and David actually gives Catherine to him as a birthday present for the night. Oh, that's so thoughtful. It, very thoughtful, right? So at this point that's when they start to plan out how they would kidnap women for their sexual purposes and they even create a code word for when they have the person that they both agree is a good fit. Uh, one or the other would say, I got a case of the munchies. And if 
the other partner didn't veto the girl, that's who they'd end up taking. With that being said, on October 6, 1986, 22-year-old Mary Nelson meets David at the, at the yard that he's working in. And David offers her cheap tires. Uh, all she has to do is pick them up at his house. That's where he had them stored. Once they're there, David chains her to his bed, gags her, and rapes her, all while Catherine watches. They then take her to Glen Eagles National Park, where David rapes her again, and then strangles her with nylon cord, and stabs her, thinking it would speed up decomposition. Then they bury her there. Two weeks later, they pick up a hitchhiking Susanna Candy, who was 15 at the time. Once in the car, she was held at knife point with her hands tied. They got her home and gagged and chained her to the bed and raped her, same as they did to Mary. This time, Catherine joined in on the attack, though. When David tried to strangle Susanna, she became hysterical, so they gave her sleeping pills to calm her, and when she fell asleep, David told Catherine that she had to prove her undying love for him by committing the murder herself, and she does. They bury Susanna close to Mary's body in the park. Then on November 1st, they find Nolene Patterson, who had run out of gas on her way home from work. Again, once in the car, she was held at knife point, and when they got her home, they raped her, and the plan was to kill her that night. But David seems to create a connection with her and decides to keep her. So they let her live for three days. And David grows really attached to her in that time, which makes Catherine extremely jealous. And she threatens him and says he needs to choose her or Nolene. And if he chooses Nolene, that she would kill herself. To save Catherine from killing herself, he then gives Nolene the sleeping pills and strangles her while she sleeps. They take her to the park as well, the same park, but they bury her further away from the other two bodies. Then on November 5th, they abduct 21-year-old Denise Brown while she's waiting for a bus. They take Denise home, and same as the others, they chain her, gag her, and rape her. They then took her to a different place. They take her to Wanneroo Pine Plantation, and they rape her again while waiting for nightfall. David stabs Denise there and puts her in the grave, thinking she was dead, but she sits up. Uh, so then he takes an axe, and he hits her in the head with it twice. Oh. Denise is the last person to be murdered by the couple as the next person they picked up was Kate. This case goes on to be known the more house murders. So when on trial, David pleads guilty to four counts of murder and one count each of abduction and rape. He receives four life sentences and Catherine is sentenced to the same four terms. Good. Yeah. Both were required to serve 20 years before being eligible for parole. David spent most of his time in solitary confinement as there was concern for his safety in general population. And on October 7th, 2005, David was found hung in his cell. So the one documentary that I watched, and it was kind of good, it was, it was a psychologist that was explaining the sexual sadism of, of the case and, and like why they did the things they did. And she said that the, the true reason why he would have committed suicide would, because of his personality, would have been out of boredom because he's confined in a prison cell. He can't act out his fantasies. There's nothing else for him to live for. Like there's nothing that he would want to do because he's stuck by himself. Damn. Yeah. So Catherine was not allowed to attend his funeral and she has, so she's also had her parole requests in 2007 and 2009 denied and in 2009, the attorney general in Australia decided that she would stay in jail for life, like actual life. She is only the third woman in Australia to have her parole papers marked as never to be released. In, so in 2016, Kate Moyer uh, started a campaign to stop the automatic process of putting convicts up for parole every three years. She says that Catherine herself never actually applied for any of her parole hearings. The automated process required, requires them just to do it automatically, which also requires them to contact Kate every three years. So it would inevitably, it would just bring up a lot of bad memories. So she wants that process to stop. And interestingly, one of Moyer's supporters in this fight is Catherine herself's son, Peter. Wow. Yeah, so Peter is in full support. He actually goes a bit further and says he, he actually calls for his mother's execution. But Damn. 
Yeah, but he's had a he's had some awful stuff. So people have actually physically attacked him just for being hit her son. Oh, so this poor guy is living the repercussions of her actions. So what happened he, to the other seven? Or the other six? Maybe you don't know that. Uh, no, it's the only one that <laughs> they actually talk about anymore. Yeah. And I think because he became part he, of the a act. public figure in that sense. Exactly. Oh. Uh, but for Kate, she's now an artist. She's a businesswoman and a mother of three. And her and Laura Hancock, the officer that fought for her, are still connected now all these years later. Good. More yeah. power. Thanks for sticking by her, man. <laughs> yeah. I know. Wow. So that oh. more house murders. And I knew you'd know it. Yeah. Uh, it's so... Uh, thank God for Chicky there being addicted to drugs and <laughs> forgetting to lock her up because... That's what saved her life. Yeah, yeah. And for her being smart enough to do all those things. Oh, yeah. Like, it, it's uh, that's pretty uh, amazing because you're so traumatized, obviously, right? Well, that's happening. And to be able to, like, think logically like that and really, like, piece the, everything together around you to know that, like, if you do get out of there, these are going to be important factors to yeah. proving what's happened. So, I mean... I can't, that's got to be really hard to do. That's incredible that she was able to take that much information in. Well, and the even scarier thought is, did she do some of these things hoping that someone would find them? If if she she didn't didn't make it. Yeah. So that's my story. Wow. I mean, so sad for all the other women, but thank goodness for Kate, uh, you know, getting out of there. And so that could... They would stop their reign of terror. <laughs> exactly. Because imagine, like, that was in five weeks. They killed four women in five weeks, and she would have been their fifth. Wow. So very quick succession. And the psychologist in this documentary that I watched as well, it she said that it would have progressed further because as they were progressing through each attack, the focus was becoming more about, about the death and less about the... The sexual gratification. Yeah, well... Yes, like, but the sexual gratification was becoming linked to the death and not the yeah. actual sex. So it was, it was wow. interesting. Uh, if you, I can't remember the name of it, but if you actually, you know, on YouTube, if you type in Kate Moyer, it's the very first one that pops up. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I'll definitely take a look at that. I, uh, I recently started listening to like an audio book kind of going on the whole like progression and everything of psychopaths basically, but. He does a lot of interviews with people, but he sort of breaks it down into like, you know, how we know, like the frontal lobe, that kind of thing, but your amygdala and how that works with your limbic system. And so that people like that, it's, uh, (laughs) there's not much of that going on. And so Mm -hmm. their, their gratification gets stronger and stronger and stronger to the point where basically they can't stop. Exactly. Um, You know, as you pointed out with them, that it was going to continue to get more violent and probably happening more often so damn (laughs) I'm I'm happy she survived (laughs) me too um it's funny that you did like so when I started I was going to start looking at uh like I was trying to find serial killer survivors and stuff I ended up taking a different route but I did that thinking that it you know similar to like how your story played out um that there would be more of a history and stuff that they would show yeah and more but yeah (laughs) (laughs) I'm just rambling (laughs) all right well that is it for my portion which means that is it for this week so guys i hope you enjoyed my story but don't go too far because in one week we will put out sheena's episode where she talks about her survive her person's survival story I survival keep- story <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> thankfully i haven't had to survive that much so <laughs> <laughs> all right so join us next week Bye. Bye.